So yeah, thank you for inviting me along today, Jeff and Joe. I thought that was an incredible talk as well. Uh, I suppose we've been on our own similar journey. Uh, first introduction, I'm David Romley, Biz Dev Director at Waracle. Uh, we're speaking about entrepreneurial challenges in mHealth and wearables and also the opportunities that, that come off the back of them. Uh, I'm going to kind of talk to a broad agenda here today. I might do kind of a bit of traversing, so please forgive me if I do. And again, like Chris, if you feel compelled to say anything, then, then please go ahead. Um, so a bit about Waracle, a bit about Dundee, which I think is really interesting. Our kind of journey through mHealth. Uh, there are things we can talk about to do with mHealth and there are definitely things that we can't talk about which is a massive shame. Uh, and that kind of brings us on nicely to the challenges of working in this context and also the opportunities and a bit of a view on, on where we think it's headed given our work in mHealth. Uh, I always start every talk I do with a big disclaimer that I'm not a healthcare professional, I haven't studied medicine. Uh, I've run an app business for the last kind of eight years. Uh, so, so, so yeah, if I say anything that, that people think is incorrect, you can just accost me later on at the bar. Um, although I'm not a healthcare professional, I do think that a lot of innovation in mHealth and, and healthcare in general is being driven by non-healthcare specialists and actually being driven by software developers and hardware developers. So I think that's a really important distinction. Uh, so Waracle, we're the biggest app developer in the country. We started about eight years ago. It's my brother that started it uh, and my colleague Mike Wharton. Uh, we've grown to a team of about 45 now and we specialise in, in mobile apps for iOS, Android, and we're now doing wearable and, and IoT stuff as well. So we do our kind of mobile and IoT projects in Dundee. Uh, we also do a lot of our kind of consulting and research and strategy in Dundee as well. We've now got a new stream to our business which has completely exploded in the last couple of years which is essentially building mobile teams in enterprise organisations. So huge demand from consumers and from staff for mobile uh, solutions and enterprise haven't been able to recruit or retain a mobile capability so they get us to come in and do it. So we've probably got about the best part of 20 people at various locations across the country uh, acting as a mobile capability. So we mainly work in Scotland, UK and Europe and our two biggest verticals by far are banking and, and healthcare. Uh, in general, we're quite wide. We do a lot in transportation, utilities, data centres, that type of thing. But we're a very, very data-driven company and we see ourselves as data scientists and engineers. We don't see app development as a kind of creative pursuit. We see it as, uh, as engineering uh, and we're very strict on our kind of agile processes as well. And, and yeah, we're much wider than just a kind of dev shop. We do a lot of strategy and consultation, that type of thing. Pitch over. Uh, these are some of the guys that we work with. There are also people on there that, that we can't talk about, and I'll come on to talk about that later on in the talk. Dundee's a really, really cool place, and if you get a chance, go up and see it. There's a really great cross-section uh, at the moment happening between software, games, pharma, medical. We try and be right at the heart of that. Uh, there's big advantages to a small city, it's easier to network, there's a lot of trust, openness and collaboration and we just see it as a unique mashup of skills. I don't know how Dundee has, has, has got to be in this position but it has and, it, and it's really interesting. Um, so our journey, I've kind of broken it down into three phases. The first phase of mHealth projects that we started doing uh, were all about process efficiency. So they're about replacing kind of archaic processes in a healthcare setting with mobile processes. Uh, and that was to do with kind of driving the cost down of delivering those services. The second phase we saw was really to do with using the mobile as an engagement tool. So if you're conducting a clinical trial or a big medical research initiative, how do you harness the power that's kind of in your pocket? How do you get people to stay in the process longer? Uh, and how do you use kind of gamification and UX techniques to do that? And that's part of the reason why I think that these kind of revolutions in healthcare are also being driven by software professionals, not necessarily healthcare professionals. Uh, 
The third phase is all about harnessing the sensors that are available. So we do a lot of work, sensor-based work on the phone, on wearables, IoT, even kind of augmented reality now. Uh, so the industry is maturing quickly and it's building upon all of these things. Uh, but I'll come on to speak about the kind of challenges and opportunities that, that, that take place. So things we can talk about, so we work a lot with the NHS. One of our first jobs was a, a patient assessment questionnaire. So previously, when assessing kind of patient feedback, someone would have to write up a survey, they'd have to print it off, they'd give it to someone in the waiting room, someone would fill it out, they'd hand it back, that data was then manually typed in. We installed a kind of tablet-based end-to-end process which completely kind of wiped that out. Uh, because people are more used to using mobile technology, it was a tablet that was kind of handed about in, in the waiting room. And that's estimated to save the NHS about 50k a year. So it's a really clear ROI and it's a good example of a kind of end-to-end -end tablet process in a, in a kind of healthcare setting. We also do a lot with Imperial College London. Uh, I was interested to hear about Jeff's comment to do with low-hanging fruit. These tenders are extremely difficult to win, and we'll come on to talk about why, why they're so difficult. Uh, but we developed an application called InfoMatch. So ICL do a lot of medical research initiatives. They have a huge database of people who want to be involved in those initiatives, but it's administered via letters by phoning people up, which just seems completely archaic. So we developed iOS, Android and Windows mobile apps, which was really to kind of increase the sample size, increase the throughput of people in these initiatives to try and generate better data. So this is all about kind of shortening, again, the feedback cycle between trying to involve people in medical research initiatives and actually getting them in the door. And then we use lots of clever kind of gamification techniques to, to keep them in the process once, we're, once they're in there. So these are things like a uh, feature, uh, uh, preference-based push notifications. So I would select when I download the app uh, which studies I'm interested in. I would then only receive specific studies that I could fill out on my phone, fill out a survey to see if I was compatible or not. And I'd find out very quickly. So again, you're just completely kind of short-circuiting this, this feedback loop. So there's certain things that we can't talk about and it's, it's a real shame. We've got about six people employed directly by one of the biggest pharma companies in the world, doing lots of cool work across mobile, across AR, uh, across wearable and IoT, but we're restricted in what we can say, uh, which is frustrating to say, <laughs> to say the least, uh, which is a neat segue onto some of the challenges that, that I see and that we see in, in working in this industry. Um, so big pharma and biotech are very, very competitive in terms of IP and they're very restrictive in terms of what their suppliers can talk about. Uh, we obviously use our track record to win more business. We use it to attract staff. And if we can't, then, then that's an issue. But the nature of the work that we do with pharma companies, the people that are working on it absolutely love it. If you ask them working on kind of pharma or fintech, they'd much rather work on, on the kind of healthcare side of things. It's obviously heavily regulated. I remember having a, when I had to go out and pitch over in Switzerland, I read the FDA guidelines on the plane. Uh, which was, yeah, kind of uh, pretty heavy duty stuff to say the least. Uh, so I managed to talk a good game when I was in the presentation. But, but yeah, that stuff is just incredibly complicated and you need to have kind of close collaboration with subject matter experts and legal as well before you end up getting into trouble. And these are the kind of costs of doing business that you don't anticipate when, when you get into the industry. Um, a real bugbear of mine is public sector procurement processes and how stifling they are to do with innovation. It's absolutely... A, a, like astounding to me uh, how slow some of these public sector organisations move uh, and how little input the, the kind of end supplier has in creating the brief. So when we start a project, we speak with a client and we sit down and we talk to them, we do very iterative kind of collaborative sessions. In the public sector, they write a brief of what they think they want and then they put it out 
and you have zero control of influencing that and you have to bid with a fixed cost and a fixed time scale and the system is just completely broken. And what I worry about is there's going to be a big gap between innovations in private healthcare, kind of free spending, kind of competitive market forces. These guys can spend a lot more and can innovate quicker and there's a potential to leave the public sector behind, which, uh, which is potentially quite worrying. They also, big organisations in general, suffer from kind of hugely fragmented technology strategies. And what you'll find is that part of an organisation will spend a lot of money developing something and another part of their organisation is doing exactly the same thing. The, the organisation kind of internally doesn't speak to each other, they duplicate a lot of spending uh, and they duplicate a lot of technology which makes it difficult to kind of bring everything together uh, and do what you think is the right thing to do. You have to a lot of compromise uh, in these projects. Uh, you're also integrating with kind of legacy IT and software architecture that isn't necessarily conducive to kind of fast moving iterative mobile software. So again, these two things are, are a bit of a clash. And also there's a kind of mojo clash. We do things at 100 miles an hour. We, we develop super quick and all our processes are really nailed. Uh, when we're working with big healthcare companies, it can be really, really difficult in terms of the speed we want to work at and the speed the client can work at. And given how fast the industry moves, you can't spend like a year, two, three years on big healthcare initiatives. Things change. People, people change their habits and the way they engage with technology. So it needs to be done a lot faster. Um, so rant over. Having said that, there's lots of opportunities. Uh, Jeff kind of talked about some of the numbers and they're just like eye-watering. Um, we see kind of IoT and mobile as the next revolution in healthcare. And again, that's being driven by software developers and technologists that's not necessarily coming from, from healthcare. Um, three things that we see as being absolutely huge and three things we do a lot of work in. Remote patient monitoring, so the type of stuff Chris is talking about where you have a wearable, it's sending data to someone who can kind of predict and preempt things. And again, you're shortening that, that feedback loop. And that can be through uh, mobiles, it can be through wearables, it can be through AR, that type of thing. Um, Telehealth as well, kind of outsourcing part of primary health care to more automated systems we see as, as a huge opportunity to get into. Uh, I think the technology is so pervasive, pe people are ready for that. Would people rather have uh, go to their GP when they've got a cough uh, and, and go through the kind of palaver of getting an appointment and wasting their time or would you rather do something discreet on your phone? There's a lot of people that wouldn't, but there's a lot of people that would, so there's huge savings potentially there. Uh, and behavior modification, when we talk about behavior modification, we mean kind of push notifications and messages telling you to get off your arse and, and, and move about. Uh, that's the kind of software driven part of things where we're using kind of UX and gamification techniques in software to get people to do things. And again, that's a big opportunity in health, uh, as that's kind of the key to, to prevention and preempting certain, certain diseases. So we were at a healthcare conference recently and Goldman Sachs came out with this huge report to do with, with the potential value of IoT and wearables. Uh, they estimate the total savings opportunity by implementing IoT solutions being $300 billion. So it's not exactly uh, an insignificant number. And the commercial opportunity for IoT revenue being about $30 billion. So these are big, big numbers that, that we're talking about here. Uh, and the market can definitely sustain new entries, new innovation and new disruption. Um, so with connected devices kind of supporting healthcare studies and healthcare services and preemptive consultation, what we're seeing is it's almost this kind of neural network whereby there's more connected devices, there's more data, there's more learning, meaning we can have more insights and, and, and better kind of healthcare outcomes. So the more we create this in kind of ecosystem of connected devices, the more learning we have and, and, and benefits will hopefully kind of reach out to the patients. And also, this is just kind of reiterating my other point, we feel that I mean, mobile is probably the most pervasive technology that I've certainly had in, in my lifetime. Patients are ready. We find people are ready and, and willing to, to kind of 
engage with healthcare services via mobile or a tablet or let people take your heart rate and your blood pressure uh, to try and preempt things. Uh, so, so again, we, we feel there's a huge opportunity there and that's obviously something kind of Chris is, is tapping into. Um, what we think is next, so, so this slide I thought was really, really interesting. Uh, it's all about the kind of spectrum of disease and where we think the money is going. So the money has been going on this part, which is all about diagnosing and treating using mobile and, and, and IoT and things like that, we see it moving much more towards predict and preempt. So, so how do we actually uh, forecast that something might happen in the future using all these connected devices? Uh, and how do we stop them from happening? Because this, the, this is the kind of costly part, right? Uh, and there was a quote that underpinned it, which I thought was particularly uh, kind of resonant. hundred years from now, someone's going to look back and say, can you believe they waited until you got a disease and then did something? And I just think that's incredibly profound. And that could well be right that in a hundred years time, they will look back and think, what, why were they focusing so much on this end stage? Why weren't they, with the, with the tools and technology they have, why haven't they been focusing on kind of prediction and preemption? Um, so... That's me, I think. Uh, here's my details and happy to speak to everyone in the reception afterwards.